We've talked a lot about the Great Commission, much to say about it, those words that Jesus leaves the disciples with, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And he goes on to, to tell us, what, what does that mean? Teaching everything that I have taught you, obeying and baptizing. So Jesus gives these descriptors of what it means to be discipled, that we would learn from Jesus in his message, that we would submit and obey to Christ in his message, which ultimately leads to the proclamation of what Christ has done for us in, in, in baptism. And so the, the man we get to, to hear from today is a man who's passionate about discipleship, not, not just uh, simply sharing the gospel, which is a wonderful thing, but we need people to share the gospel and to train believers. See, one of the most difficult parts about evangelism, we have a group going out today, what you'll find is one of the most difficult parts of evangelism is what happens when they say yes. What, what happens when that person says, yes, I want to know about this Jesus? We need to be prepared, not just to preach the gospel, but to make disciples. And so Jim Blumenstock is one of the, he's a dean over at Asia Biblical Theological Seminary. He's been there for over 20 years, 23 years now. He's a graduate of Grand Rapids Theological Seminary, which is now Cornerstone Theological Seminary. He and his wife have served there for 23 years. They're passionate about making disciples in Asia. He was telling me that they have uh, quite an interesting model for this. They, they go to the students in Asia to teach them. They don't really necessarily have one central location, but, but they long to see disciples, so they go and meet them where they're at. And he was telling me that they're stationed as right now in four different countries in Asia, passionate about making disciples of Jesus Christ. So we're very blessed to be able to hear from him today. Will you join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Blumenstock? Am I on here? Thank you. Uh, thank you for braving the snow this morning. And I have a confession to make. I think I may be responsible for this. <laughs> I live in Thailand. And a week ago, before we left, it was 100 degrees. It's our hot season. And it's been 100 degrees for several weeks as a high. And I'm looking at my wife, and we're saying, wouldn't it be nice if when we go to the States, there's a snowstorm? <sighs> God answered my prayer. And I am sorry for that, but I'm actually enjoying this. This is exactly what I prayed for. So, welcome to spring. I have a long history with Cornerstone University going on for well over 20 years. Ever since 1996, when I first came to Grand Rapids and newlywed and entered the MDiv program at the seminary here, graduated in 99, and I haven't really left the Cornerstone orbit since then. Uh, back in 2001, I joined Asia Biblical Theological Seminary, which if you have not heard of it, it is part of Cornerstone University, your Asian seminary out there in Thailand and other parts of Asia. And so I've been with ABTS for 23 years, serving as dean and as professor there. And uh, I also have a lot of connections here to the university in that my nephew Nathan is a senior graduating in May, and my daughter Ella, who I will not embarrass today, is a sophomore here. So if you uh, want me to embarrass her, feel free to come up afterwards and I'll show you some baby pictures that I'm sure she will love. <laughs> well, I have the privilege of living in a part of the world where 26,000 people are coming to Christ every day. I just need a pause to let that sink in. <laughs> 26,000 people coming to Christ throughout Asia every day. In fact, I think this is representative of perhaps the greatest story of our time. I don't know if you're aware of what is taking place in the majority world, but we are seeing for the first time a rapid shift, a seismic shift in world Christianity. If you were to look back to 1900, the world would have looked something like this. Every four out of five Christians you would meet would be from the majority world or the global north. They would be from North America, from Europe, or from Russia. Four out of five. But the situation today looks a little bit more like this. We are seeing a rapid growth in the majority world, which includes South America, Africa, and Asia. And it's happening at such a pace that I don't think the church really understands what God is doing in this part of the world and to the extent of this growth. 
Today, every two out of three Christians would be from the majority world. So whereas for hundreds of years, the center of Christianity was situated in North America and Europe and Russia, it is now more situated in South America and Africa and Asia. In fact, some of the fastest growing nations for the church are in Asia. Do you know what the fastest growing, where the fastest growing church is located? It's in the country of Iran. In Iran, back in 1979, they estimate there was around 500 Muslim background believers. That figure today is estimated to be around 1 million. That means there are more converts in the last 20 years than in the previous 13 centuries combined. Second to Iran is their neighbor, Afghanistan, which is also a rapidly growing church, interestingly because of Iranian believers coming to Christ, crossing the border, and sharing the gospel in the country of Afghanistan. In Nepal, the church grew 40% in the last decade. And of course, the greatest growth story is in China. According to the Boston University for Global Christianity and Mission, about 40 years ago, there were about a million Christians in China. Today, that stands at 100 million. So in 40 years, we've increased at least 99 million believers in China. So I figured this out. You know, I'm a little bit of a math guy. And so I got my calculator out. 99 million divided by 40 divided by 365 comes to 6,780 converts per day for 40 years straight. It's astounding. And even in my country of Thailand, where the population of Christians is less than 1%, which seems rather discouraging, 98% Buddhist. Even in Thailand, the Christian population has doubled since the year 2000. Half of all churches in Thailand were planted in the last 15 years. God is doing something, something amazing in Asia and in the majority world. Of course, this does not mean that it is without challenges. This next picture shows you where the unreached people groups are located. And if you notice the big red blob hovering over Asia, right? We have the most unreached people groups in our part of the world. 100 million Christians in China sounds fabulous, but remember, there's over a billion people there, right? So there are so many people who have not heard about Christ. And of course, this is the center for the world's religions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam in particular. So there's still great need, but this is where I feel like, uh, and Tate mentioned this, the importance of discipleship. With so many people coming to Christ every day and the church growing so rapidly, the question is, are they becoming disciples? It's not just about rallying and as many people as we can get, but actually allowing them to conform to the image of Christ and helping them grow in their faith. So that's exactly what ABTS is all about, Asia Biblical Theological Seminary has been around for about 40 years. And our whole purpose is to train church leaders in Asia to disciple these new converts. So we do this by allowing them to earn a master's degree from here, Cornerstone University. And uh, you know, from, for Asians in particular, a US degree is of high value. So over the years, many Asians would, would come to America or Europe and try to get a degree. And many times they would just stay there so ABTS has brought a U.S. education to them. We're situated in Chiang Mai, Thailand, but we go throughout Asia to allow them to earn a master's degree from Cornerstone University. And in essence, we bring Grand Rapids to them. So the way we do this is we call ourselves a seminary in a suitcase. We do not have a residential program. We don't have dormitories. We don't have people staying there full time. Instead, our office located in Chiang Mai is just a headquarters by, from which we go and we send the professors to the students. And we have students scattered all over the place. Here are some of our locations right now. We have several class sites in the Philippines, several in, in Thailand. We have a large location in Delhi, India, and we just started in the United Arab Emirates just this year. We had our first class just this last quarter. Uh, and we can really go in and out wherever the students are. If we have a group of 15 students, we will take an entire degree program to a location, whether it's in their church, or in their uh, Bible school or even in a hotel and gather the students and allow them to earn a master's degree in just a couple of years. I think perhaps the greatest thing that our students like about ABTS is its affordability, and I hate to say this here, I know you're paying quite a bit for your education. 
our students pay an average of $35 per credit hour. And that is something that is affordable for them. And the only way we can make that work is by raising funds here in the States in particular to offset that cost. And I know what's going on in your minds right now. How can I get to Asia and uh, finish my degree there? But <laughs> talk to the president about that. But ABTS is really about our students. So let me share a few stories of what our students are like. The first one is Jestoni. Jestoni is in the southern Philippines in the city of Davao. And this is in the, the island of Mindanao, way down in the south, large Muslim population. And he's part of a church that has recognized that there are a lot of Indians all of a sudden coming into the city of Davao in the Philippines. In fact, there are 7,000 Indians who are studying in medical school in Davao. And there's a strange influx of Indian students coming to the Philippines for medical school. So the church decided, hey, let's reach out to this group. And so Jestoni has been involved in reaching out to the Indian community. He started with Bible studies, having fellowships, enjoying Indian food, which always brings many people together. And over time, people were uh, hearing the gospel and converting and eventually brought into the Filipino church, which is this beautiful picture of heaven, of multiple nationalities coming together as one body of Christ. Or I can mention Nelson. Nelson lives in Hong Kong. He's a former businessman, and before he became to Christ, he was a working professional with the company of haagen -Dazs. And he was able to kind of rise the ranks. He spent his time climbing the ladder of success. And he got to a point in his life where he was just enjoying the jet set life. He was flying all over the place, enjoying wonderful food, whining and dining wherever he went. And he just kind of felt this emptiness. Yes, he reached the top, but it wasn't quite what he was expecting. So he heard the gospel, a friend shared the gospel with him. He converted and he realized, I need to do something different with my life. He ended up leaving the professional world and he started an NGO called Hope of the City. And he realized that so many immigrants from China are coming down to find a better life in Hong Kong. But they do so with extreme poverty and they're not able to find the work and so they tend to congregate in one part of the city. So Nelson and his wife chose to live in that part of the city, an incarnational ministry, so they could reach out to these poor immigrant Chinese, sharing them with the love of Christ and showing them the love of Christ. Or perhaps I could tell you about Deborah. Deborah is in the city of Delhi. She is a professor of dentistry. And uh, Deborah is actually, what makes her interesting is she is a professor of dentistry in an Islamic college. So it's 99% faculty are, are Islamic, and then there's one Christian, Deborah. And it's allowed for her to be salt and light in this very unique environment, so much so that after she's been there for so many years, the faculty of religious Islamic studies in the school invited her to do a talk, a presentation, and listen to the title of the presentation, Faith in Jesus Christ and its Impact on Christians. She did this about four weeks ago. And when she presented, 80 people from the Islamic Studies Department came to hear her presentation, and it was published in the Urdu newspaper the next day. Or finally, let me tell you about Maria. Maria is a Filipina. She lives in Thailand as a missionary. And she's in a part of Thailand, in Western Thailand, right on the border of Myanmar. And you're familiar with what's happening in Myanmar, right? There's a civil war taking place. Well, for so many years, people in Myanmar were fleeing a civil war that's been going on for decades. And as they flee uh, for the sake of their lives, they just have no home, they have no food, there's no income, and so they go into, cross the border into Thailand. And many young ladies who cross the border into Thailand are looking for work. Well, there just happens to be some people here in Thailand who are at the border, gathering these people and promising them jobs in the big city of Bangkok. So the ladies think, oh, this is great. So they join this person, ends up being they're going into prostitution. The sex trafficking trade in Thailand is notorious. And they're picking off these young girls from Myanmar and bringing them straight into the sex trade there in Bangkok. So Maria saw what was happening and she realizes we need to do something to stem this. So she started something called Faith House. And Faith House is a, is a home where she is keeping, uh, allowing young women to stay there. And when they stay there, they get protection from all that's going on with the sex trade. They learn English. They grow in their faith. 
They go to school, and at the end, they even have a scholarship program to send these young ladies to university afterwards. Well, these are just four of our 180 students and 500 graduates. And if you have a question of how God is building his church in Asia, here are some examples. People who love the Lord, who are passionate for the gospel, and are out there planting churches and changing lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, these are powerful stories. And as I think of this and what God is doing in Asia, it reminds me of a passage of scripture in the book of Acts. Uh, are you familiar with Acts chapter 2, of course, is Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down and he empowers the apostles to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth. And the very next chapter, in chapter 3, do you remember Peter and John are doing their first evangelistic campaign? And they leave their group and they go to the temple of all places. They're starting at the very center of the Jewish universe. <laughs> And they go to the temple, and Peter and John are there, and as they enter into the gates, they encounter a lame beggar. And this beggar, we're told, has been there for years, decades. So he's kind of a fixture in this temple complex, and he, as always, every day, he's asking for money. And as Peter and John come to him, the beggar asks John and Peter for money, and Peter looks at him, and he says, look at me. I don't have any silver and gold, but what I have you, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And that verse then says this kind of amazing way, like his legs and ankles are strengthened. And he's able to get up and walk. And so the lame beggar follows Peter and John into the temple complex, into the portico of Solomon. And as they come into this area, the beggar is so excited, he's walking and jumping and praising God, which as you can imagine is causing quite a scene. So people are there, and they're hearing this screaming going on, and they're seeing a guy jumping around, and they look over, and they say, hey, isn't that so-and-so who was the beggar at the, at the beautiful gate? And so they start crowding around, and they're kind of like, what's going on? This is the same guy. I can't believe it. What happened? And pretty soon, this crowd develops, and Peter, being Peter, sees this as an amazing opportunity, and he preaches a sermon. And the sermon is essentially, it's this guy's walking because of the name of Jesus Christ, the same Jesus whom you crucified just a few weeks ago, probably. But God had a greater purpose and he raised him from the dead. And now it's time to repent and turn. And we're told many people came to Christ through that sermon. But of course, it didn't go well for Peter and John because the Sadducees heard this. They heard him talking about resurrection and their ears perked up when they heard the word Jesus. So they, sent, uh, they went over to Peter and John and they sent them to prison. They wanted to question them. And we're told in the story that the very next day, the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of all Judea, they want to question Peter and John. In fact, included in this council are the high, is the high priest himself the same people that were responsible for condemning Jesus. And so they question Peter and John. They say, hey, look, we know what happened with the beggar. We don't understand it, but we heard you talking about the name of Jesus and resurrection. You can't do that. So please, don't say anything about the name of Jesus. And you remember what Peter says? I can't do that. Sorry. I'm not going to obey human authority. I'm going to obey God's authority. And I can't help but proclaim what, God has, what I have seen and witnessed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, the Sanhedrin has no choice but to let them go, and so Peter and John go back, and it says they go back to their people, which is probably like a smaller group of disciples and friends, and Peter and John share what happened. And as they explain what took place, the very first response of this group is, we need to pray. And so we have this amazing prayer recorded in chapter 4 where they pray, proclaim to the sovereign Lord and they talk about how in his sovereignty even Jesus Christ had difficulty and was con as, uh, uh, condemned and crucified and now Peter and John are experiencing a similar thing. And they ask, God, please take note of these threats and continue to work in signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. And this is the verse that I find most interesting, because right after that prayer, this is what happens. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Why did God shake the earth? He doesn't do that very often. He did it in Pentecost, the previous couple chapters. But if you look at the rest of Acts, when they go into trial and difficulty, God's not shaking the earth. Why does he shake the earth here? Well, think about what's happening. Peter and John are on their first evangelistic crusade. They go to the temple, which is a very important place, and they're probably pretty excited. They're like, man, Jesus is risen from the dead. The Holy Spirit has come upon us. We've witnessed this. There's some amazing power in God and what's taking place. I bet if we go to the temple, so many people are going to come to Christ. And they go there and they share the gospel, and what happens? Peter and John get thrown into prison and told to shut up. So as they come back and they're praying, I have a feeling they might be a little bit discouraged. Maybe all of this was a little unexpected. With all the power of the Spirit of Pentecost, maybe they expected the the whole Sanhedrin to just say, you're right, Jesus is alive. So they needed assurance. They needed to know they were on the right path. They needed courage to continue on. In fact, that next part of the verse, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They had that courage given to them. Well, I really believe that God is shaking the earth again. When we look at the seismic shift of Christianity from the north to the south, from the minority world to the majority world, we see God doing something again. Do you feel the shaking Do you see what God is doing? And just like what he did for the apostles, the reason he's doing this is to remind us that God is present. He is still working. He is building his church and he's doing this even through experiences of opposition. And so as we think about this, I think we have to do a few things or at least consider a few things. And one is we need to have an awareness of what God is doing right now in the world. You know, as I come back to the States, it seems like every year when I come back, the church is a little more discouraged than the previous year. There is a rise in religious nuns. Those are people who say they have no religion whatsoever here in the States. There's a growing frustration with the church, especially among younger generations who are seeing the scandals and are tired of that and the authority that is represented there and are leaving the church in droves. There are cultural shifts taking place right now. And America is rapidly becoming a post-Christian nation if it's not there already. And I think it's leading to the sense of despondency. What is the future of Christianity? Where is God in all this? Is he still working? And this is, I think, where it's important for us to take our eyes off of our immediate context, to no longer look at just America or even just the Western world, and to see a vision for what God is doing in the rest of the globe. Because when you see that story and the rapid rise of the church, it's encouraging to know that God is still working, isn't it? Christ is still building his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail. It's just maybe he's not doing it right in our neighborhood. I believe this awareness brings encouragement and I'd like to encourage you as most of you are part of the American church that God is still powerful. He's still acting. He's shaking the earth once again. Secondly, involvement. What do we do with this? Now, when my day, when I was becoming a missionary, this was a long time ago, 20 plus years ago, and really the way to get involved in what God's doing overseas is to become a missionary. You know, you have to go to seminary, you get a theology degree, you uh, raise support for two years and ask people to give you money, and then you go overseas and spend your life overseas. And that's kind of the track that I took. But things are different now. And I feel like what's happening right now is more and more, at least as I see it in Thailand and other parts of the world, people are deciding to just live overseas, whether it's digital nomads or people teaching English or other uh, subjects in schools throughout Asia, uh, being a professional in some of the bigger cities, and they've just decided to live there for a period. 
And I think this is amazing and actually a wonderful opportunity because so often missions has this perspective of uh, we have the answers and we're going to go over there and give it to them. But based on what God's doing in the world, it's actually the opposite right now. God is using the Asian church to build the Asian church. And I have realized after 20 years in Asia, I came with all the answers and now I'm listening to them for their answers. It's the Asian church that needs to be teaching me. And how awesome would it be for you after you graduate here from college to go overseas for a couple years and just come with an attitude of, I want to learn. I want to see what God is doing firsthand. I want to be part of this church and just say, man, how is this happening? And what can I do to help? And maybe helping is just listening. Or maybe it's coming alongside and partnering. But I think just witnessing what is happening can be valuable for you and for the church. And then thirdly, worship. I feel like missions too often is focused on what we do. Samuel Escobar, a South American theologian, called this managerial missions, which is a corporate model. Here's how we do missions. We have this great goal of how we want to see the world evangelized. So we get a bunch of people around a table and we come out with a goal and we have a strategic plan. We throw a bunch of money and resources at it and then we have a growth goal and see how it ends up coming to fruition, just like how you'd run a business. And Escobar says, well, maybe that's not exactly the way God does this. And what I find is so interesting of what God's doing in Asia is how he's doing this, yes, through missionaries, yes, through his people in the church, but many times completely on his own. And you've heard stories about visions and dreams taking place in the Middle East, of healings and exorcisms in Asia, and perhaps one of the most interesting stories is when you talk to people hearing how they come to Christ. So let me close with one story. And this is the story of Kay, who's a Chinese Thai who was at the time living in Bangkok. And I interviewed her and asked her about her conversion story. She was in an abusive family. Her father abused her repeatedly, physically and emotionally and verbally. One time, he dragged her outside so that he could punish her publicly and shame her before all the neighbors. One time, Kay came home with a good grade, which usually she didn't get good grades, and uh, the father said, there's no way you got this. You cheated. So he grabbed her, took her back to the school in front of a class in progress and told the teacher she does not deserve this grade. And she gives me story after story of what was taking place, and it got so bad that during this time, she was depressed, she was discouraged, she was suicidal. In fact, she tried to kill her parents. (laughs) She started putting poison in their food, little bit by little bit, which thankfully did not work. And it came to a point when she was at the end of herself, and she says, I just need to give this up. And so it's about midnight. She's by herself watching TV. She has a razor blade as she tries to cut her wrists. And as she says how I, she looked down and she realized she cut in the wrong spot. She can't even kill herself correctly. And it's at that time that as the TV is on, suddenly something catches her attention. Because you know what was playing on the TV at that time? The Jesus film. And it was right at the end of the film where they start talking about the Uh, how if you're struggling in life and you have no place to go, that Jesus is an answer. And she heard this, and suddenly she describes it like the TV was talking directly to her. And she dropped the razor blade. She's entranced with what's saying, and in that moment, without having ever met a Christian, she bows her head along with the TV and prays a prayer. And that began her Christian life. God's powerful. And he's doing things in amazing ways and only ways that God can do it. And you know what? That deserves worship. Amen? Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for what you're doing in Asia and around the world. You are building your church. What a privilege it is to be able to witness it. We are living in an amazing moment in history. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to know what to do about this, how we can be a part of it, how we can listen to our brothers and sisters throughout Asia and Africa and South America and be a part of this global movement. And, Lord, we pray that you continue to build your church. 
And Lord, that many people would come to know you and grow in likeness of Christ. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Stand and worship with us. Thank you.